Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for joining us for this, for this evening of inspiration. And first of all, I want to give a very, very special thank you to the Miami Beach Kolel for joining together with Yeshiva Torah Chaim Torah Semes and putting together this beautiful, beautiful night. And a very, very special thank you to Rabbi Eli Wiesel from the Miami Beach Kola for coming and joining us here tonight so that we can all gain some chizuk, some chizuk during this time, during this very, very challenging time for everybody. Now, I wanted to start with a story that, uh, that I read recently. There was a doctor, a very, very new doctor, who was assigned to the oncology ward in a hospital, and that was the beginning of this doctor's experience. And while there, while in that oncology ward, this doctor developed a very, very close relationship with one of his patients. And as time went on, they got closer and closer. Yet unfortunately, a few months into that relationship, the patient passed away. And this doctor was so upset. This doctor was so taken aback. They built up this close relationship. And he was so bothered. He was so troubled. He was inconsolable. And the other doctors came over to him, and they tried to comfort him, and they said, don't worry about it. You're being overly sensitive. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. As time goes on, you're just going to get used to it. This happens all the time over here. And this doctor, not only was he not consoled by their words, but he was actually very, very troubled. He said, isn't sensitivity something that I'm supposed to foster? Isn't sensitivity a feeling that we're supposed to strive to have? And when I was thinking about those doctors' words, it really, really resonated within me. With regard to my feelings that I'm having right now, and with regard to the whole situation that's happening with all of us. On the one hand, it's true. As time goes on, human nature is such that we just get used to things. And we become less sensitive. However, the reality is that that doctor is 100% right. Sensitivity is a virtue that we have to grow in, and that's exactly what Hashem wants from us, especially, especially at this really, really challenging time. A time when we're suffering, we're dealing with an outbreak that has infected over 3.6 million people worldwide. It has killed more than a quarter of a million people. According to a recent Goldman Sachs survey, 50% of small business owners had said that they didn't think that they'd be able to continue their business operations for more than three months. And in just four weeks, just four weeks, over 20 million Americans have lost their jobs, unemployed, don't know how to put bread on the table. And even those of us that are healthy, and those of us that still have our jobs, there was a recent poll that said that nearly half of adults in the United States reported that their mental health has been negatively affected due to worry and stress over the virus. Life has changed completely. Social distancing, isolation, very, very difficult time. And that doctor is 100% right. During this time, what we need to do is we need to foster, we need to feel even more sensitivity. Even though, unfortunately, it's kind of becoming a reality. And I think that this message is so true and is so important, especially in the time period we're in now. You know, it comes as no coincidence that right now, we're in the period of Avelis, over the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva who perished during this time period. And we're all familiar with the Gemara that tells us, what was the reason for their death? What was the reason that they perished? Because they didn't show the proper honor towards each other. And Rav Aram Kutler, Zechard Tzadik Levracha, says that it doesn't mean chas v'sholom, that they caused pain to each other. No. These were great tzaddikim. But rather, it's just that they weren't on the highest possible levels of giving. They didn't reach the level that they were supposed to in their derech eretz, in their honor, in their kavod, in their sensitivity towards one another. Clearly, being sensitive to each other is a very, very, very important and critical component of our yadus. So what can we do? What can we do? We're here tonight, we're gathered together to get chizuk, to talk about sensitivity. What can we do, especially at this time, to increase our sensitivity? And the Torah tells us something unbelievable. 
that in the times of Mitzrayim, during the bitter slavery, Moshe Rabbeinu goes out of the palace of Paro, and he sees what's going on, and he sees a Jew being beaten by an Egyptian. And the Torah tells us the following words. It says, Vayar besivlosam. Moshe Rabbeinu saw their pain. He saw the pain that the Jewish people were feeling. Vayarish mitri. Ish ivri. Make ish ivri meachav. And he saw this Egyptian hitting one of his Jewish brothers. And Rashi comments, what does it mean that he saw? Of course he saw their pain. The pain was going on every single day. Of course he saw and he understood what was going on around him. Rashi comments, you know what it means, Vayar, that he saw? He says, No saying, Einov velibo lihios meitzar alehem. Moshe Rabbeinu set his eyes and his heart to feel the pain of the Jewish people. That means that Moshe Rabbeinu stopped. He focused. He looked at what was going on. He saw that Jewish brother of his getting beaten. And he stopped and he focused on the situation. And only then did he feel true pain. Only then did he feel the ultimate levels of sensitivity for his brothers. It sounds so strange. Moshe Rabbeinu was a man who was so unbelievably sensitive, cared so much for everybody. And the pain, the slavery, the terrible things that were going on in Mitzrayim, everybody knew what was happening. However, Moshe Rabbeinu understood that in order to feel real sensitivity towards somebody else, you have to stop. You have to take a step back and just look and analyze what is happening and focus Zero in on it. And when you zero in and you focus in on that situation, you're no saying in of, you place your eyes, the libo, in your heart. Then you can truly feel and understand what they're going through. I heard a story that's unbelievable. Rapam was walking with his son, and they found on the floor a $20 bill. And his son asked his father, he said, Tati, can I keep that $20? And Rapam said, halachically, you could keep the $20. However, you shouldn't spend the money until tomorrow. Don't spend that $20 until tomorrow. His son was so overjoyed. He was so excited. He got this 20 bucks. So he takes it home, and he's ready. He can't wait tomorrow. He's going to spend the money. And then it dawned on him, why can't I spend the money until tomorrow? I want my ice cream now. Why can't I spend the money now? And so he goes over to his father, and he asked him, what's this halacha that I can't spend until tomorrow? And his father said, halakhically, there's no problem. The $20 is yours. However, we have to realize that somebody out there in the world lost $20. And that individual feels such sorry. He feels pain right now. He's upset that he lost that $20. It wouldn't be so appropriate for us to go spend that $20 right now. While he's suffering, while he's feeling that pain, just wouldn't be right. Wait till tomorrow. By tomorrow, that individual will probably forget about it, won't bother him as much, and only then you should spend the money. Rapam was teaching his son that you have to focus. You have to recognize when somebody else is going through a painful situation. And I think that the first thing that we need to do right now is to take this lesson, this lesson from Moshe Rabbeinu, this lesson from Rapam, that we need to focus in on what other people are going through. Focus in. Take a step back and think, whoa, when I get that news feed that talks about how many more people have gotten the virus, when I receive that information about that close friend of mine that lost his job and doesn't know how to put the bread on the table, to stop and focus. 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 Think about it. Recognize it. Ultimately, that's going to bring us to even more sensitivity. But now what? So I'm focusing on it. I'm thinking about it. I'm recognizing their pain. But what am I supposed to do? We have to take a lesson from one of our imahus, from Rivka. What an unbelievable thing the Torah tells us. You know, Avram Avinu was looking for the best possible shidduch for his son Yitzchak. He wanted the best girl out there. And he sends Eliezer on this task to go find that girl who's going to be the perfect wife for Yitzchak. And Eliezer gives a sincere tefillah to Hashem to find the right girl. Listen to what he says. He says, He says, the girl that I asked to please give me the jug of water. Please give me a jug of water. Give me something to drink. The Umrah. 
שסי וגם כמלך ההשקעה. And she says back, I will give you what to drink. I'll give you water from the well. And, and additionally, I'll take out water for your camels because I see that they're thirsty. Eliezer was asking Hashem that the person who should be the wife for Yitzchak should be one who is, has reached the highest levels of Gemilus Chasavim. Person who's on such a high level, that's a person to become a member of Avon Avinu's household. And Revolvi points out something unbelievable. What was that criteria? To be called somebody who's a Gomel Chesed? A person like Rivka who looks beyond the circumstances. A person like Rivka who says, you know what? I know you're only asking me for a drink for yourself. However, I see that not only you are thirsty, I see that your camels also need. I'm able to look beyond the circumstances. I'm able to look beyond what you told me and really, really see your need and to provide it for you. That's the message of Rivka. So the next step is really to be able to think like Rivka, to zero in, what does my friend need? What does my friend need at this, at this difficult time? Do they need money? Or do they need a warm smile? Do they just need a phone call? What is it that they are truly lacking? And they're not going to tell you. What is it that they're truly lacking that I could provide for them? To look beyond the circumstances. To look beyond what they actually say. You know, there's a rub that on Erev Pesach, he was asked the following question. Somebody came over to him and he said, Rabbi, can you fulfill the mitzvah of Dalit Kosos, the mitzvah of the four cups of wine at the Seder, using milk? Would that be permitted? And the Rav said, hold on one minute. And he went back to his office, and he came back to this gentleman, and he handed him a very, very large sum of money. And he said, here you go, this is for you. This is for you to spend on all of your needs that you need for Pesach. And the man was so thankful, he thanked the rub, he took the money, and he left. And the Talmudim asked him, they said, Rub, what, what was going on over there? Why did you give him so much money, so much more than the value of four cups of wine? And he said, listen, from his question, I understood. If a man is asking about drinking milk as the four cups of wine at the Seder, obviously he can't afford meat for his meal as well. It's not only the four cups that he's lacking, but he's even lacking the meat, and he's lacking all the bare essentials for the Seder. And I recognized that, and I saw that, and therefore I handed him all the money that he needs to be able to get in that. Revolvi points out from Arashi that this is really a three-step process. Rashi says, Tzarechulaseis leiv, we need to place our heart, v'litroach, and we need to work, v'lirdof achreha, and to go chase after it. Tzarech Lasei Slave means we need to look carefully, place our heart onto what that person is lacking. Litroach, to work hard to find the answer of what they need. And then ultimately, Lirdo Fachrecha, to go get it and provide it for them. I heard the most unbelievable story the other day about a couple that fulfilled all of these three levels on the highest, on the highest of levels. This past Pesach, there was, a, um, there was an older couple. There was an older couple that had lived in a, uh, that had lived in a retirement, in a retirement uh, residence in Lakewood, New Jersey. And they wanted to be there in order to be close to their children. However, about two years ago, the husband, he passed away. And the wife was so upset. They had such a close relationship for so many years. And these last two years have been very, very difficult for her. However, Baruch Hashem, she was able to spend so much time with her children who lived nearby. And everything was okay until this Pesach. When everybody was in quarantine, and she was told that she cannot spend the Yontif together with her children. She was so upset. She was grief-stricken. I mean... I mean, I don't have my husband anymore, and now I can't even spend Yontif, I can't even spend the Seders with my children? She was inconsolable. And one of the neighbors found out, found out about her distress and what was going on, and they called her up and they said, listen, you know, your apartment is very close to our apartment, and you have a window that's adjacent to our dining room. 
So I have a very simple idea. We're going to move our dining room table over to the window. And you could be by your window, and you'll be part of our Seder. You're going to join together with us for the Seder this year. We're so excited to have you. The elderly woman was so happy. She's going to join with a family for the Seder. She's going to be with company. She's not going to be alone. And after the first days, that woman called her children, and she was so excited, she was so happy, she couldn't stop talking about how incredible this Seder was. And she said, you have to understand, the best part about it was all the songs that they sang and the minhagen that they had. You see, this family, it just so happened that they had the same exact minhagen as your father. And they sang the exact same tunes that we sang in our house all those years together with Tati at the Seder. And I felt so comfortable. I felt so at home with this family as they were singing those songs that brought back my memories to our family Seder that we had for so many years. However, little did she know that this couple did not have the same in Huggin. And this couple did not share the same tunes at their usual Pesach. However, when they knew what was going on with this woman, they spent days before Pesach calling up her children. And they asked the children, they said, are there any special minhagim? Are there any special songs that your mother is used to at the Seder? And the children told them, yes. And they sent them voice recordings of those tunes. And this couple spent days before Pesach listening to those voice recordings, memorizing those tunes, and transformed their Seder into the same exact Seder that this woman had been used to for so many years. That family saw deeper. That family was able to see what this woman really needed. They were able to look far beyond. Yeah, it's a big chesed to invite her over for the Seder. That's huge. But they went even further, just like Rivka. They saw what she really needed, and they went that extra mile. And, you know, when you stop and you think about this, all of this, I don't know, it sounds a little bit overwhelming. You know, and like, the Torah really expects me to feel this way towards everybody. The Ahavta Lorecha Kamocha, you gotta love your neighbor like yourself. Everybody? That's really, really hard. That's really, really challenging. Especially at this time when I have my own challenges that I'm going through. Everybody listening right now, everybody has their own difficult circumstance. This isn't easy for anybody. And yet, during this time, I'm expected to feel this level of sensitivity towards everybody out there. And the truth of the matter is, it's not so overwhelming. There's a mission in Perk Yavaz that tells us something unbelievable. In Perak Bay's mission at Tess, Rav Yeshua gives us the advice, the advice that we need to hear in order to acquire the midah of Ahafta Lareacha Kamocha. You want to know how to get that midah? Loving your neighbor like yourself? You want to know how to acquire that trait? Rav Yeshua tells us that you need to be a chaver tov. A person needs to be a good friend. What does that mean? What does that mean to be a good friend? And the Rabbeinu Yonah points out something unbelievable. He says, you know what that means? That means that you have to pick one person, just one person, that's it. One person to be a good friend towards. One person that I go all out for. One person that I truly attempt to accomplish via hafta l'recha kamocha with. Just one person. One person that I really, really try to focus in on what they need, just like Rivka. And Rabbi Yonah says that when I do that, when I focus on just one person, when I try to think like that couple in Lakewood, with one person trying to think, what does that individual really need? Then I'm going to grow in my sensitivities. I'm growing in my midah v'yahavta l'recha kamocha. And Rabbi Yonah says that ultimately that spills over. It spills over to everybody else in Kal Yisrael. We start with just one individual, and it spills over to everybody. You know, last year, shortly before Pesach, 
I had the opportunity to spend a uh, to spend a Shabbos in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, and I was davening there. I was there for a bar mitzvah, and I was davening there in the Young Israel of Memphis. And the rub of the Young Israel, Rabbi Akiva Males, shared the most unbelievable story during his drasha. It was so unforgettable. He said that when he was a single bacher in yeshiva, he was studying in Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim in Queens many, many years back. And he said that on Shabbos, he used to go, he had this, uh, this kind of this job, working in a home for developmentally challenged, uh, de- developmentally challenged men. And it was in Brooklyn, and he would go there for many, many Shabbosim to spend time there serving as a counselor together with other fellows as well. And they would provide a Shabbos for these men. And he said that there was a guy there in the home, a guy by the name of Baruch. Baruch was in his upper 70s. And every single Friday night, Baruch would share a Dvar Torah with everybody at the table. And he would say over what that week's Parsha was, and he would share with all the counselors and the other guys in the home his thought, some meaningful thought that he had on that week's Parsha. And afterwards, everybody would tell him, beautiful job, Baruch Yasher Koach, that was so nice. And Rabbi Mills noticed that Friday afternoon when he would come in, Baruch would be on the phone sharing this Devar Torah with somebody. And this continued on week after week. And one time Rabbi Mills asked him, he said, you know, I'm just curious, who are you talking to on Friday afternoon when you're sharing and you're practicing that Devar Torah? And Baruch looked at Rabbi Mails and he said, Oh, Friday afternoon? Oh, I was talking to Rav Palm. And Rabbi Mails was taken aback, Rav Palm? You mean Rav Avram Palm? The Rosh Hashiva of Torah Vadas? That's who you were talking to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was talking to Rav Palm. Rav Palm is my rabbi. And Rabbi Mails and the other counselors as well, you know, they said, Okay, you were talking to Rav Palm. Wonderful. That's amazing. The following week, once again, he came on Friday afternoon, and he sees the guy talking on the phone, and he hears him saying over the Devar Torah again, practicing for Friday night. And once again, he asks him, who are you talking to? He says, I was talking to Rav Palm. Okay, Baruch, that's amazing. We're so happy that you talked to Rav Palm. But yet, they didn't really necessarily believe him. It was so hard to believe. Every single Friday afternoon, He's having this conversation with Rapan. And one week, when Rabbi Mills came in, he said that, uh, he said that, that, that his curiosity just got the better of him. And Baruch was on the phone once again, relaying over this to Torah. And he knew that if you were to ask Baruch, who are you talking to? Baruch would say that he's talking to Rapan. So Rabbi Mills went over to another phone that was in the kitchen that was connected to the same line. And he was just so curious. He had to find out the truth. He had to find out what's really going on. Who's he really talking to on that other line? And he picks up the phone and he hears on the other line the voice of Rav Avram Pam, Zechert Tzadik Levracha, saying, Baruch, that is such a beautiful Dvar Torah. Baruch, thank you so much for sharing that Devar Torah with me. Thank you so, so much. And then the phone call had ended. When Rabbi Mills asked Baruch, what is your connection? How is it that you talk to Rapam every single Friday afternoon? Baruch said, well, Rapam is my rabbi. You see, many, many years ago, approximately 50 years ago, Rapam was a rabbi in a shul in East New York, and my family davened in that shul. And I developed a relationship with Rapam. And we had kept up for many, many years. This relationship started 50 years ago. And while Rabbi Mills wasn't sure if they were talking every single Friday for the last 50 years, one thing was for sure. This conversation took place for several, several, several years. Every single Friday afternoon, Rav Pam would give his time to talk to Baruch, to hear his Devar Torah, 
to give him a good word and to make him feel so good about himself. That's what the Gedolim are all about. That sensitivity. On a time Friday afternoon, I'm sure Rapam wasn't sitting around twiddling his, th twiddling his thumbs Friday afternoon trying to figure out what to do. There was a lot to do. And he was a very, very busy man. One of the Gedoli Hadar answering questions from all around the world. Yet Rapam understood full well what it means to be sensitive, what it means to be giving, what it means to really, really care about another member of Klal Yisrael. And Rabbeinu Yonah is telling us, just pick one person. Just go all, go all out for one individual. And then ultimately we will feel this for the rest of Klal Yisrael. And during this time, this time of social distancing, this time when everybody's at home and we're not really socializing with other people, we're not spending our time out there with others, but we're spending our time at home. It makes so much sense for us to pick that Chavar Tov to be somebody in our family, somebody that we're spending so much time with right now, to develop that sensitivity, even greater level, levels of sensitivity than we have right now. Whether it be towards our spouse, whether it be towards our children. And ultimately when we do that, that's going to spill over to everything else that we do. The first thing that we have to do again, we have to, we have to focus, we have to learn that lesson that lesson that we were taught from Moshe Rabbeinu, we have to stop, we have to see the pain, we have to be no saying, ain't a valibo, focus in on what is going on and what people are feeling. And especially at this time, when there's a lot of pain going on, a lot of pain physically, and a lot of pain emotionally, and a lot of pain financially, now is the time that we have to focus in on what people are feeling. And we can never forget the Midah of Rivka, the Midah of that beautiful couple in Lakewood that went beyond, that went beyond the request, that was able to look even deeper to see what that person really, really needs. And lastly, we shouldn't get overwhelmed. But we need to think that in order to use this time to develop, to grow in our sensitivities, what we need to do is listen to Rabbi Yonah. Listen to Rabbi Yoshua. Take one friend. Develop one good chaver that we can give to. Whether it be our spouse, whether it be our children, whether it be somebody else. And develop that midah of the ahafta l'recha kamocha. And that will ultimately spill over to everybody else. And Be'ez Hashem, in the schus of our growth, in the schus of this inspiration, and our growth and our sensitivity towards everybody, towards all of Klal Yisrael. Be'ez is Hashem. Hashem should send a refuah shalema to all those who need it and a nechama to everybody out there. And, uh, and at this time, I am so, so excited to introduce Rabbi Eli Rizel, Avrech from the Miami Beach Kola, who came down here to, uh, to share with us some words of chizuk. And I can't wait to hear him. Thank you so much, Rabbi Rizal, for joining us. Without further ado, Rabbi Rizal. Thank you, Rabbi Moskowitz. The truth is, is that I planned on getting here just in time for Rabbi Moskowitz's speech. I was going to stand in the back and prepare. And then I figured when I come up at 9 o'clock, I'd have my speech prepared. But unfortunately, or fortunately, his speech was so captivating and I wasn't really able to uh, prepare my thoughts. But the good news is, it's, uh, thanks to Rabbi Moskowitz, excellent chizuk for the time, and I'm, I'm so happy that I came when I did. Um, it was very touching to me, and uh, something that I will share with my family. It is an uh, honor and privilege to be standing in the yeshiva, um, the yeshiva that I spent my uh, years from elementary school, junior high school, high school. I remember it was probably 12th grade, was the last time that I was standing in an empty base medrash like this. And it was late at night, I was preparing for the shear the next day. And I saw the place was empty, the podium was, you know, usually the rabbi gets up and he's speaking. And I saw it on his opportunity, I climbed up on the podium and I started speaking in a loud voice and I started getting into it. It was empty, it was probably one o'clock in the morning. And I turn around and there's someone standing in the doorway and I'm waiting to see, you know, some feedback. And he says, Rizel, keep it down. People are trying to sleep upstairs. Hopefully, this time when I have a, an empty base medrash, but so many of you out there, um, 
Merz Hashem will be able to learn something uh, significant together tonight. A special thanks to the Yeshiva, Yeshiva Teres Emes Teres Chaim for hosting. A special thanks to the Miami Beach Community Kola for hosting. And again, it's an honor and privilege to be with you tonight. I'd like to start out with a medrash, the medrash on this week's Parsha, Parshas Emor, who tells us, we have a mitzvah of Svira, Svartem Lochem Imacharas HaShabbos. We're supposed to count Svira, reminder everyone should count Svira. Sheva Shabbasa is to Mimais. I, I couldn't pass through that without, without mentioning that. Sheva Shabbasa is to Mimais to Yena. We are commanded to count seven complete weeks. Asks the Medrash, when will the weeks actually be completed? And the Derek Drush, the Medrash, answers with one line When Klal Yisrael fulfills the will of Akadesh Baruch. Hu. That's the question of the Medrash, and that's the answer of the Medrash. Tonight, we're going to delve and try to understand a potential explanation to what the Medrash specifically could be referring to. I start out in a Gemara and Masechtas Makas. The Gemara and Masechtas Makas is dealing with specific rulings for murderers. If someone kills, and they're obviously punished. If they kill in a specific way, if it's considered an unintentional murder, and we can prove that it's an unintentional murder, then what happens is, the Torah says, Venas al achas harim el, the an unintentional murderer, has to go to a city of refuge known as the Ari Miklat. The Gemara and Yoram and Aleph and Masech Tasmakis describes that in this Ari Miklat, in the city of refuge, which this unintentional murderer must live until the death of the Kayin Gadol, he has to stay there, he's not allowed to leave. He is provided with basic necessities of life, food, water, there needs to be people living there, there needs to be protection, Anything that promotes life needs to be presented to this unintentional murderer at that time. The Gemara continues. He needs to be able to study Torah. Not only does he need to be able to study Torah, but his Rebbe would be sent to the Ari Mikla to be with him, so that when he's in the city of refuge, separated from his family and the rest of the world, he'll be able to study Torah the way that he's accustomed to studying at the highest level with his Rebbe. The Gemara says, where in the world do you get that from? That's taking a little bit far. I understand the food, I understand the water, basic necessities. Now you're talking about the guy having a shear on demand, in, not Zoom, in person, in the Ari Miklat, for potentially many years, where do you get this from? And answers the Gemara, the same Pasuk, because the Pasuk says, Vachai, he needs to go to the city of refuge and he needs to live. He needs food, he needs basic provisions. Because he needs to be able to live always in the Ari Mikla. That same Pasuk, says the Gemara, also teaches us that he needs to be able to have Torah. And he needs to be able to have his Rebbe. He needs to be able to continue to learn the way that he's used to at the highest level. I, hear, I heard uh, many times from my Rebbe, someone I'm very close to, Ravelio Omer Sarutskin. He says in the name of his father, Lord Shmuel Birnbaum, the following question. I understand the food and provisions, v'chai, he needs to live, check, we're good with that. I'll even give you, he needs to be able to learn in the Ari Mikla. I'll give you that too because we say, ki heim chayenu, we say it every single night, Torah is our life. So I'll give you that one too. He needs to have Torah, he needs to have food, he needs to have provisions, he needs to have his physical and spiritual life intact because the Torah says v'chai, he needs to have life. But as to Rabbi Shmuel Birnbaum, why does he have to have his Rebbe there? Now, I'll grant you that he may not be able to learn at the highest level as he would be if his Rebbe was with him. We'll grant that. But that's already a little bit past the, the, the basic guideline of the basic necessities that provide life. We gave you the food, we gave you the drink, we gave you the Torah, your spiritual life is intact. You don't know how to read a Pasuk? Get an art scroll. Does the Rebbe need to be inconvenienced to go with this guy to the Ari Miklat so we can go back and forth on a Marsha? Is that, it's nice, but is that Vachai, is that a bare bones basic necessity that we are putting inside of this requirement Vachai, that he needs life and he needs the Rebbe there so he can go through the Rajba and the Ritva and the Marsha with his Rebbe? Is that considered a bare bones necessity of life? This is the question of Rav Shemuel Burnbaum. The Pasuk says, in the beginning of Parshas Va'ira, it's a very interesting Pasuk, Va'idaber Hashem el Moshe, HaKash Baruch was talking to Moshe Rabbeinu, 
Now let's just put a little bit of context behind the times that we are now discussing in Parshas Vayera. The Klai Yisrael has been now in Mitzrayim for many years in slavery, hundreds of years in slavery. Moshe Rabbeinu now comes and he's telling Klai Yisrael, we are preparing for the Exodus. Vayitzaveim el b'nei Yisrael, and Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu to command Klai Yisrael to start getting ready for the Exodus. The time has come. The time has come for Exodus. We're going to be redeemed from Mitzrayim. Go tell Kla Yisrael. Hashem tells Moshe to command Kla Yisrael. The Yushalmi in Rosh Hashanah tells us that with the word Vayitzavim, command Kla Yisrael, which is a little bit out of the ordinary, command Kla Yisrael that we're leaving. The command is actually talking about that there was a mitzvah given at this time. There was actually a mitzvah given right here, right, meaning we're in the Exodus, we're getting ready for Yitzhak Mitzrayim. I want you to tell Klai Yisrael there's going to be a mitzvah. Now it's not one of the mitzvahs that you probably think I'm about to say. The Gemara Yushami Rosh Hashanah Per Gimel says that right here, right now, Hashem says, I want you to tell Klai Yisrael about the mitzvah of Evan Ivri. For six years, and every every is going to work. Uva shaviz, but on the seventh year, yetsei lachav shichinam, the every every is going to go free. Right here, right now, there's a mitzvah. It's specified in Parshas Mishpatim, which we see a few parshas later. But right here, right now, says the Rishami, is when it was actually initiated. Vayitzavim, when Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, command Klai Yisrael. It was in the performance of a mitzvah, and the mitzvah was every every. Have an evid for six years. We're talking about a Jewish person, a Jewish servant, who potentially stole from somebody. He doesn't have money to pay back. So the halacha is he's taken as a slave by his fellow Jew to repay the debt that he owes. And after seven years, no matter what, he goes free. Yeitzay lachav shechinam. That is the context. And that, says the Rishami, is what the Pasuk is referring to, Vayitzavayim el Bnei Yisrael. Imagine if, God forbid, someone's driving on the highway and all of a sudden chaos starts. A bunch of cars start piling up, hitting each other. There's pieces of cars flying. You see flames, smoke, and it's all happening in a flash right in front of you. And you swerve to the side, swerve to the other side. You get out of the way and you make it to the shoulder of the road and you're completely intact. It's a five-car accident. God forbid in front of you, but you're safe. And your heart's beating. You're sitting there in your car, you just missed in a flash, everything was fine. And in two seconds, the whole highway is destroyed, but you're safe on the side of the highway, taking a minute to breathe. And you're sitting there staring out the windshield, breathing, your heart's beating, and all of a sudden from the back, you're dead, 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 dead. But what? What's for dinner tonight? Give me a second, I need a moment. We are sitting in Mitzrayim. We have 10 makos happening. Dam Tzfardei Akinim. And all of the different details that are happening in each one of the makos. We have a carbon Pesach being prepared. We're taking the God of the Egyptians, tying it to our doorpost in their face. We're getting ready for the splitting of the sea, a miracle that we talk about numerous times in davening, numerous times in the Torah, over and over. Asher Eitzesi, Eschem Eres Mitzrayim. Dad, 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 dad. What? I'm in the middle of crossing the Yamsuf. I want you to know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that when you have a servant for six years, if someone's... Well, let me tell you what happened. You see, if someone's still... For, just wait a second. Someone stole from you and he's not able to pay you back. You're going to take him as a servant. Make sure on the seventh year of Ashvi, Yetzi Lachav Shechina. Seriously? That would have been my response. Right now, right here, what's for dinner? That's what's so crucial when we're getting ready for Yetzi Asma Trayim. This is the question of Rav Chaim Shmulevitz. In Sikhus Musar, he asks Is this really the right time to introduce this mitzvah? Seemingly completely non relevant to the times. We're in a major drama. We're getting ready for miraculous events. We're talking about 10 plagues. We're talking about Asara Makais. We're talking about Kriyas Yamsuf. We're talking about Karban Pesach. And we have Akash Baruch who says, I want you to know that there's a mitzvah called Evid Ivri. Now it's a crucial mitzvah. It's one of the 613 mitzvahs. We are not downplaying it in any way. But is this really the opportune time, as from Chaim Shulevitz, to present this mirror by Yitzhaveim El Bnei Yisrael? Now is the time for the mitzvah of Evid Ivri, Uvashvi, Yitzhay Lachav Shechina. Augustus Caesar, he was a statesman, he was a military leader, he actually became 
the first emperor of the Roman Empire. That's Wikipedia. I, just, I checked it up to double check to make sure that's accurate. And the, the safer that I saw this story in is actually accurate. He was a military leader and the first emperor of the Roman Empire. One of his battles that he was in the middle of fighting wasn't going so well. And history says he was very successful. But this one carved out battle was not, being, was not going so well. It actually got to the point that he, he was in battle with his men and obviously he was protected with many soldiers in front of him. But it got to the point that the enemy soldiers were able to get through most of his security and he saw that it was only moments away that they'd get through all of his security and his actual life was at risk. So what does he do? He had no choice. He was a major leader. And although his ambition and motivation to stay with the soldiers said stay in battle, he booked it. He started flying as fast as he could from the battlefield because he needed to remain the leader of his empire. And it would have been a tremendous loss to his entire country if he perished in battle. So for the good of his country, he retreats. And he was right. The enemy breaks through his final means of security. And he's being chased when he realizes that he's not going to get any further. He goes down a block. He sees a house of one of the people that lived in his country, bangs on the door. Now, that must have been a very weird interaction. You know, the guy, he pause on his remote, he goes through, yeah, boom, and Augustus Caesar comes barging in, you know, with flying, he leaves his, uh, parks the horse in the backyard, and he says, you gotta hide me, the enemy's coming. He looks out the window, everything seems calm. Trust me, the enemy's coming. And of course, his nobleman, the person who, who lived in his country, recognized that this was Augustus Caesar. He immediately abides by his emperor, and he, he says, I actually have a very good hiding spot in my house, and he hides the emperor, Augustus Caesar, in some fake floor in his house. Well, the enemy soldiers saw the, pretty, the, the basic location of where the emperor ran. So they start going to the area and they start knocking on every single house and ransacking it, searching for the emperor. And they're on the block. They're getting closer and closer. The Augustus Caesar feels the, the pounding of the horses outside. They're getting closer and closer. And finally they come into the house that he's actually in. He's on a, down on the fake floor hiding. And they barge into the house and they, they don't even listen to the people that live there. They push everyone aside. They start ripping up the house and they're actually got as close to right on top of the Augustus Caesar, right where he's hiding, right on top of his fake floor but they didn't find him. The hiding spot holds, he's successful, and they leave, they continue going on, and after a bunch of hours, when the coast is clear, the Caesar comes out of his spot, and he actually ended up going back to battle, and they were successful, and they defeated the enemy. When the smoke cleared, and Augustus Caesar is back in his palace, numerous months later, he remembered the deed of that nobleman, that person who lived in his country, the one who hid him. And he had his guards go to his address and bring him in front of him, the emperor. Augustus Caesar, when he sees his friend who hit him, he calls out, he says, My friend, my friend, tell me anything you asked for, I will provide for you. You saved my life. I was desperate. And you hit me and it was successful. Anything you want, I will provide. I'm a rich man. You name it. And the man looks at Augustus Caesar. He says, quiet for a few minutes, he's thinking, and finally he says, here's what I want. I want you to describe to me the moment that the enemy soldiers were standing above your head in the hiding spot. Describe the fear that you felt at that moment. Augustus Caesar, was, it was a time of joy, they were celebrating the successful victory, and there was music and laughing, and when he heard the request of this man, what did you say? You want me to describe my vulnerability in front of all the people in my country? You embarrass me, you mock me, you remind the entire country of my vulnerability. I'm the emperor, the audacity that you have to come and ask for such a thing. I won't reward you. I sentence you to die. Take this man to the dungeons and tomorrow he will be, appear before the entire country and I will personally hang him because I am the emperor and I am not vulnerable. They took the man, they dragged him out to the dungeons, and it went from celebration to trepidation. The next morning, as the Augustus Caesar, as he announced, he showed up on time, 
and he was going to hang the man who saved his life. The entire country heard about the story and it became very popular. It was, um, they didn't have social media, but news spread very quickly and a big gathering showed up to see the emperor hang the man who saved his life. They dragged the man out of the dungeon. He has dirt over his face and he's dragged out. They put the gallow around his neck and the emperor walks up on stage and all he needs to do is pull the lever which will hang the man who saved his life. And there's a hush amongst the crowd. Is he going to do it? Is he going to go through with it? And the emperor walks up with a stern face. He's very angry about the challenge that this man had the audacity. He wanted the emperor to discuss his vulnerability. And right as he's about to pull the lever, he whispers in the man's ear, he wanted to know how I felt at the moment that the soldiers were above my head. This is how I felt at the moment that the soldiers were above my head. And he freed him and sent him back home. Obviously, his guards asked him, what in the world is going on? You're making a mockery out of us. Take him to the dungeon. Bring him to the gallows. Save him. Back forth. Give him a reward. Don't give him a reward. And he explained, I promised I'd give him anything he wanted. But the only way that I could give him what he wanted on his specific request to describe the vulnerability that I felt at that moment, there's no words in the world that could have done it properly. It had to be the situation. Because the situation, the context behind that situation, lent itself to unprecedented understanding of what it means to have enemy soldiers above your head. The moment of trepidation when you think you're about to get hung, that was the only way that I was able to provide the reward that I promised this man. And so, I carried it out in that way. HaKadosh Baruch Hu realizes that we are about to leave Mitzrayim. Asher Eitzesi Eschem Eretz Mitzrayim. It is the time of complete miracles. Asher Maka Yiskriyas Yamsuf, and so on. Now HaKadosh Baruch Hu Vayitzavei Nel Bnei Yisrael is a mitzvah. Eved Ivri. Is this really the time to be talking about a mitzvah of Eved Ivri? Says of Chaim Shmulevitz, Hashem is teaching us an unbelievable message. There is absolutely no better time to learn the mitzvah of Eved Ivri. And do you know why? Because in order to really accept the mitzvah, in order to take it belayv shalem and commit to it with a full heart, with a complete heart, you have to be able to relate to it, which we call a moment of sensitivity, a moment of appreciation of the event, a moment of appreciation of what the mitzvah entails. That is how human beings are able to connect belayv shalem. Because... Normally speaking, a person has a servant. Yes, the guy stole from him. Now it's time to free him. I don't want to free him. He's doing a good job. He did steal from me. I'd like to keep him a little bit longer. Now, do you feel the pain that this man is feeling by being in servitude, by losing his freedom, by having to work for you? Do you know what it is to be freed? Uvashvis, on the seventh year, you have to free the servant. Hashem says, I want you to really be able to relate to a mitzvah. Don't just accept it out of rogue. Understand it. Take it at the moment of sensitivity. That is the time to accept the mitzvah. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, right here, right now, you were just slaves in Mitzrayim for 210 years. I can't wait to tell you the mitzvah of Eved Ivri for another bunch of years. you got to see it right now, because right now you know what it means to be a servant. You know what it means to lose your freedom. And you know what it means to gain your freedom. Any other time, just won't do it. The sensitivity is lost. You won't appreciate what the mitzvah entails to that extent. And therefore, says Rechaim Shmulevitz, this was the best time for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to tell Kla Yisrael the mitzvah of Eved Ivri, the mitzvah to appreciate what it means to be a slave and what it means to be free. Now, what about the kid in the car with the dad? Dad, I can't help you with that one. I don't know why he's doing it. He probably didn't realize that there was a car accident, so that doesn't answer that one. But the Eved Ivory we took care of. There was a man named Ruvain. Ruvain is a very wealthy man. And he lives in a town that there is a, a large debate constantly happening, violent debates between the Rabbanim and the idol worshippers of the city. The idol worshippers are constantly debating and hackling the Rabbanim, and they're calling them liars and thieves and crooks. And they're constantly debating on the accurate religion. Is it the idols or is it God? And they're constantly going back and forth. In the meantime, Reuven, who's a very wealthy man, unfortunately, 
he takes his business takes a turn and he's no longer successful in his business he was the guy giving out the money now he's a guy who needs money and unfortunately it was a very difficult turn for him he wasn't able to face it he wasn't able to live with it so it got to the point Pesach was coming he didn't know how he was going to make Pesach for his extended family they always came to him every year he was the guy at the head of the table giving other families money and now he couldn't buy a piece of matzah for his own house he was so taken by this he decided that you know he knew about the constant strife between the idolaters and, and the Jewish nation, the Jewish people who lived in their quarters and the idol worshippers at their city. He says, you know what, I'm just going to go for a walk. I'm going to go out by myself into the idol area. And if they find a, a lone Jew walking around and they tear me to shreds, so be it. That'll be the way to go. I just can't bear the embarrassment of having to deal with my family and telling them that I don't have the, uh, the, the means to provide for Pesach. So he goes for a walk and it's quiet. He can't believe it. He's expecting someone to come and start heckling him. Nothing. So he continues walking. Finally, he sees a house of idol worship, the actual house of idol worship. So he says like this, listen, I'm going to go in the house of idol worship, but hopefully they'll see me, and they're not going to allow a Jew to go in their house of idol worship. This will provoke them, and that'll be it. This is what he was trying to do. He goes in, he's there 10 minutes, nothing, not a peep. It's dead quiet. There must be something going on in town. Doesn't see a soul. Everything's quiet. He's about to turn around and go home. Plan, even this was unsuccessful. And he sees a diamond hanging from the ceiling. It's a, it's a bunch of diamonds and it's exquisite and it's a, worth a fortune. So he has an idea. He says like this. I'll go up and take a diamond. It's worth a fortune. Now, if they catch me taking a diamond, they're going to kill me. Literally, they're going to grab me and throw me in the furnace and burn me at the stake in front of all the people, go into a house of idol worship and steal their their God, their, their, their diamond. And if they don't catch me, then I'm a wealthy man. I go home and make Pesach for my family. Either way, I'm good. It's a win-win. So he does it. He climbs on one of the stools and the ladders that's high up. He grabs the diamond. No one says a word. And he makes home like a bandit. No pun intended. He gets home. No one heard anything. No one said anything. He has the diamond. And he uh, cashes it in with one of the, so, someone who, you know, someone who's able to, to buy from him without asking a lot of questions. And he makes Pesach, unbelievable, success. No one knows what happened. For all they know, he was continuing success in his business. Until a few days later, the people, the idol, were, uh, realize that some of the diamonds are missing. So they go to the, the king, who in the world is going to steal our diamonds? So they have a big meeting inside. side. It's got to be the Jews. We always have these violent debates, and they're constantly telling us that this is that the idols are nothing. So everyone else in the country believes in the idol. They weren't going to steal the diamond off the idol. But the Jew would be the only one. They send a proclamation to the head rabbi of the Jewish community. You should know that you have two days to produce the person who stole the diamond from the idol worship house. And if you can't produce that person, we will kill out. We will send away every single Jew who lives in the country. We will hold all of you accountable. The rabbi turns white. Of course nobody stole the diamond. So now what are they going to do? They're going to send someone to die on behalf of the community? They don't know who it is. And people are going crazy when they hear the edict. They gather together in the shul. Everyone's saying Tehillim and they're crying. And Ruvain hears the commotion. He goes to shul. Hey buddy, what's going on? You hear what's going on. Someone stole an idol from the a diamond from the idol worship house. They're blaming it on the Jews. The king's killing all of us if we can't produce the person who stole it. Well, Reuven realizes that he's, his time is up. He goes to the rabbi after the Tehillim, after the Tefillin, and he says, Listen, I stole the diamond. You gotta be kidding me. You stole the diamond, I stole the diamond. It was a tough situation. I stole it, but no one's gonna die. I have most of the money still left. I'm gonna go back to the, to the king. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna turn myself in. It was me. I'll give back everything that I took. And whatever happens to me, happens to me. I take full responsibility for my actions. Rabbi says, you shouldn't do this. I stole it. No one's dying on my watch. I'm going to go take accountability. That's what you want, Ruven. They send Ruven to the king. They tell him that they found the person who stole the diamond. He gets in front of the king. And the king says, Ruven, you are the person who stole the diamond. From the yes, and I brought... I have most of the money left. I spent very little on a holiday. So the, king, the king's face is bright red. He is admitting to stealing an idol, a diamond from idol, the audacity of a Jew to come and do that. Kill him, he screams, and Reuven puts hold on, I'd like a second to explain myself. This is going to be interesting. Go ahead. You have a few seconds. Reuven says, here's my story. 
All right, I was a wealthy man. I lost all my money. I was completely at a loss. I tried prayer, I tried study, I tried charity, nothing was working. Finally, I decided, I went for a stroll, I had to get out of my element, it was too much pressure. Then I passed the house of idol worship, which I've never been before because I never walked that far. Passing the house of idol worship, I say, you know what? The king of this country believes in this idol. I tried everything else. I told myself, let me give it a shot. Now the king, who was already sending him out to be killed, is interested, he sits down, continue. I walk into the king's house of idol worship. And I say, you know what? I don't believe in this. I fought against this with my rabbis for years, but I'm desperate. And I just broke down in tears in the house of idol worship. When? I hear a voice. I look around, there's no one there. It's the idol. And the idol says, my son, my son, tell me what's the problem. And I poured my heart out to the idol, says Ruve, and I started telling him that I was wealthy and I'm embarrassed and we have a holiday and I'm not able to provide my family. And I was a charitable man and now I lost everything. And the idol said, Reb Ruve and Reb Ruve. The idol had pity, said, do not fear, do not cry, I'm going to help you. Couldn't believe it. The king's idol was actually successful. How are you going to help me? The idol says, look above, I have these expensive diamonds. Come, let me help you up, it's high. Take one of the diamonds, take it home, sell it, and provide for your holiday, for your family. Do not fear. And that's exactly what I did, said Reuben to the king. So, here I am. You caught me red-handed. This is my story. Now, there's a lot of people in the courthouse. The king now had a problem on his hands. He called all of his advisors, the idol priests, and everyone gathers together in his chambers and said, we got a problem. Because if we condemn this man to death, that means we're basically saying, we don't believe that the idol spoke to him. We don't believe his story. Here he is, finally, a Jew announcing that he believes us, and we're going to condemn him to death. On the other hand, he probably did steal it. probably never happened, because, you know, we don't really think that the idol spoke to him. So what do we do? The king comes out of his chamber, followed by the priests. And he says, we hereby believe the story of Ruvain. We find him innocent and he will not be killed. Not only that, because the idol told him to take one of the diamonds, we will allow him to keep all the money that he has remaining from the sale of the idol. That was the official sentence of the king. Now the story concludes. Many of those idol-worshipping priests that had those heavy debates, that had those back and forths with the Jewish rabbis, those violent debates, it was known the the... The, the back and forth and the violence was known, the, the, the danger that it posed to the Jews because of it. Those same idol priests ended up, many of them ended up converting. Because at that moment, they recognized that they were put in that bind. They understood the truth. It was their moment of sensitivity. All of the months and years of debate, of logic, going back and forth, words being put together and organized on a paper, with an, an official moderator screaming back and forth that the rabbis had no impact. If the rabbis made the greatest argument in the world, they wouldn't have convinced the priest that they were foolish. But at that moment of sensitivity in that courtroom, the moment where it was clear, where the context behind the situation lent itself to that appreciation, had an impact on those priests, had an impact on many of the people in the crowd, had an impact on the actual king, that no one could have produced with the most creative logics and explanations created in the world. Therefore, says Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, this is the time, this is the absolute ultimate time, the best time to present the mitzvah to Kla Yisrael. We started off with the, the question that Reb Shmuel Burmam had on the, uh, the Ari Miklat. The, we have an unintentional murderer who is in the Ari Miklat, who is in a diff difficult situation, and we are commanded to provide for him basic provisions. Food, check. Drink, check. Torah, check. And we said he even has to have his Rebbe to be able to learn on the highest level. Rabbi Shmuel Birnbaum says a fascinating thing that we see from this Gemara. What we see from this Gemara is that it's not just considered ki heim chayenu, the Torah in and of itself is life, but that's not enough. Every single nuance Every addition that we can add to the level of our understanding of the Torah, to our level of observance of the Torah, to our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, every single nuance that we can add to that Torah is not just the level added. It's life itself. 
And that's why it's crucial, Rabbi Shmuel Birnbaum says, you see from this Gemara, we have to provide the Rebbe, because if the Rebbe's not there, he'll learn. He'll get the art scroll, he'll get the basic understanding, but will he be able to learn to the highest level that he's, but that of his potential? No, he won't get to the highest level of his potential. Then he's not living. It's not okay, it's not average. Then that's not considered a fulfillment of the Pasuk, Vachai. In order to be able to accept the Torah, there's, there's two different ways, I would say, that, that people do things. I always compare it to the son cleaning the room syndrome. And I'll explain to you what I mean. I have four boys. So, you tell a child, listen, I'm not allowing you to play outside until you clean your room. You're, you're going to be grounded for months if you don't clean your room. Okay, that's one version of cleaning the room. The other cleaning the room is, if you clean your room and you do a good job and you impress me, I'll send you to sleepaway camp, all expenses paid, for two months with canteen. Now, here's the difference between the two different types of boys cleaning the room syndrome. You go and check on the boy who cleaned the room. You go and check on the one who did it because you threatened him, because he's going to be grounded for two months. So he did the room, he picked up three things. Well, you didn't finish, what about the plate in the back? Oh, I didn't see that. What about all the clothes on the floor? I didn't see that either. What about the, the, the window shade fell off the thing and it's on the... I didn't see that, I didn't notice. You didn't notice that you can barely walk in here. I didn't notice it. Okay, that's his version of cleaning. Now you have the version of, I'm going to send you for an all expenses paid trip to sleepaway camp for two months with canteen. If you can impress me on the room, you come into the room spotless. Wow, I never even noticed that there was dust to clean off. You got it. You didn't have to paint the walls. I mean, that went a little bit too far. Not a, it's not a, not a, a dot, not a piece of dirt. Perfect. Because there's differences in the motivation. Says of Shmuel Birnbaum, it's not enough just to get into the Torah. It's not enough to accept the observance of Torah. We have to be that second son. We have to be looking for ways to be successful. We have to be looking for ways to make it part of us, not just do the bare bones minimum. Because if we realize that every single nuance that we add is life itself. Rav Gifter Zuchwein Levrach explains that that is what the Medrash means that we started with. The Medrash says, when will the seven weeks be complete? Sheva Shabbos Leis Tamim What is our job during Sphira? What are we trying to complete? And the Medrash says, when Klai Yisrael fulfills the will of Hashem, says Rav Gifter. What that means is, we have to change from just being the bare bones minimum fulfillment, and we have to accept upon ourselves the second degree. We have to accept upon ourselves that every single nuance, we're motivated, and we recognize that we're not enough with the mediocre average. We realize that every single added level we can add is not just the added level, we're adding life. We're motivated to that extent. And maybe it's not a guaranteed two-month trip, all expenses paid to camp, but it's a lot more than that. It's v'chai, it's life itself. And the Gemara is teaching us, v'chai means every nuance we can add, even if it's getting a marsha a little bit better. Says Rav Gifter, that's what the Medrash means when Klai Yisrael fulfills the will of Hashem. Now the truth is, is that in general it's hard to do this. It's hard, we're, we're during Svira and this is our goal. How can we actually fulfill this? In general, it's, we're, we're hot and cold. Human beings are hot and cold. We get on something and then the next day we forget about it. So how do we raise the bar sincerely? I mean honestly, everyone says that they're motivated, but how do we really change from the guy doing the bare bones to fulfilling what the Medrash says, which is our purpose of Sphira, coming to Lag Ba'imer, to be people that seek ways of getting closer to Hashem, adding levels, recognizing and being motivated that that's life itself. I would like to make a suggestion tonight, which I think can help us be very successful. Tonight we spoke about moments of sensitivity. We spoke about moments of being able to appreciate something. Now, perhaps one can look at the scenario, the situation that we're currently in, in the pandemic, and we can say, this is a time of uncertainty, it's hectic. This is a time where we don't know, people don't know what's going to be with the businesses, we don't know what's going to be with our future, we don't know if the city's opening, not opening, what's with the state, what's with the country, what's with the world? We have no idea. One thing that all the experts can tell you on any conference call you get on is three words. We don't know. That is for sure. It's a time of uncertainty. So we're talking about our goal. 
Rav Shmuel Birnbaum, the Medrash, Rav Gifter telling us that our goal in Sphira is to change from being bare bones minimum Jews to being Jews who understand that every level we can add to our success in learning, every level we can add to our observance of Torah is actually considered life. How do we get motivated to that level, especially during this Sphira, when we are dealing with the pandemic, the uncertainty that we're dealing with? And my suggestion is that perhaps this is our moment, our ever every moment, that we needed for all these years. We are in unprecedented times. We are in times where our yeshivas are closed, our bate midrashas are closed, our bate kinesiyas are closed. By Eved Ivri, we said the following, perhaps if you got the mitzvah of Eved Ivri another time, you wouldn't appreciate what it meant to be free. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, not then, not when you're leaving Mitzrayim, you don't, you don't discard what it means to be a servant. Perhaps at another time, you wouldn't be able to appreciate not having to be a slave, being able to gain your freedom in miraculous means. Not then when they were leaving Mitzrayim. I know what it means to be a slave, and I know what it means to be free. And Hashem says, that's the time. I know what's going on. It's hectic. You're going into a midbar, you don't know what's going on. There's miracles happening. There's uncertainty. You're going from 210 years in one place to a new future. But Hashem says, now is the time, because at a moment of sensitivity, when you're able to recognize, I, could, I can relate to what it means to be an Evet. Hashem says, go ahead. That acceptance is belief shalim, and it'll last forever. Perhaps at another time, accepting to go to Tefillah B'Tzibor three times a day, it's nice, but perhaps it would just be taken as, as a basic habit, something to bring mazal and atzlach into our lives. Not now. Now when over almost 300,000 people have died in the world, over 70,000 people in this country, millions of people are sick. I think we all have a newfound appreciation for tefillah. We live and die on tefillah. A habit? Something to go to to bring atzlach into our lives? How about something to go to to uphold Rafur Shlemais, to uphold basic necessities of people that we know, people in our family? How about a new appreciation for Tfilah? Is there a better time to re-accept Tfilah than right now? Is there a better time that we have a moment of sensitivity and appreciation for something than right now as we speak? Perhaps at another time, we take for granted, go into any base measures you want, you can open up any safe you want in the world and find a, a, someone to learn with and start a seder and learn any hour you want, any seder, any safer you want. But not now. But the midrashas are locked. It's hard to find svarim. It's hard to get a chavrusa. Everything has to be on the phone. Everything has to be on Zoom. Is there a better time of appreciation and sensitivity to recommitting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, never to take a base medrash for granted again? Perhaps at other times, we would have made light of the things that we took for granted. But in this unprecedented time, when the yeshivas are closed, we take for granted our children go to yeshiva every single day. They go on the bus, they come home. And now they're sitting in our home every single day, looking at teachers, putting in hard effort into videos and creativity to get our children right under our eyes. I don't think there's a greater moment of sensitivity, of commitment to making sure that our children grow up with the proper chinuch, that our rebbeim have the proper support to be able to continue teaching our children than now. So although on the outside it may not look like the opportune time, Dad, 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 says Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu in Parshas Vayira, this is the best time. And my suggestion therefore is that we all look around our families, people that we know, creates a sense of sensitivity to the moment that we're in, based on what we're going through right now. It brings us a very special connection to the things that we now lack. Torah, tefillah, yeshivas, things that we probably took for granted in the past. And if we can accept it now, if we can now say, you know what, I won't take it for granted again because now I understand what it means not to have it. Then we can be successful in our commitment. We can now get to the level that Rav Berman and Rav Gifter are talking about. Being able to fulfill the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not the bare bones, we're now motivated because our commitment is not the same commitment of the past. 
It's a commitment in a moment of sensitivity, which cannot be compared to. It's a different type of commitment. It's a commitment, believe Shalim. Let us all look around, create that, that sense of sensitivity to the moment that we currently live in. Recommit to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, believe Shalim, and Amir Tzasem, our Yeshivais will be returned. Our health will be returned. But the Midrashais will be returned. But the Knesseyais will be returned. And Mirza Hashem, the third and everlasting base of Migdash, will be returned. Then here it